Well, I want to talk to you this morning from Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, and talk to you about when God calls you to do an impossible task. When God calls you to do an impossible task, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, when God calls you to do an impossible task. Well, Friday, uh, Monday, excuse me, Monday, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. And what is the one thing they warn you not to do during a total solar eclipse? Oh, I thought it was not, not deep fried chicken. Okay. It's to not look at the solar eclipse. Because if you look at a total solar eclipse and your eyes, or even for a brief moment, you don't want to look at the sun, but in a total solar eclipse, it's even more dangerous because your eyes won't be dilated. It won't have any protection whatsoever. And so just even a brief few moments could cause permanent damage to your vision. Well, in this passage, we see Isaiah having a vision. He sees God. But it told us in the Bible in the past that if you see God, burn your eyes out and everything else in you. So let's read Isaiah chapter 6 and see how this applies. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and twain, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then said, I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto him, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and convert, and be healed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this passage, and for your word, for this vision that Isaiah has in seeing you. We thank you for the steps and the process by which he goes that may illustrate to us a powerful thing. And we ask that each one of us, if we have not gone through this, we will go through this process. And if we have, we'll do just as Isaiah did and declare unto you, here am I, send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. But the funny thing about this is, Isaiah hasn't heard yet what the job is. My wife will, quite often, she'll say something like this, I'll do whatever you want me to do, honey, within reason. <laughs> Some of the young people, I'll say, uh, hey, Dwayne, will you uh, do something for me? And Dwayne says, sure. Well, it depends on what it is. <laughs> but he says, here am I, send me, and he's yet to hear what the deal is. And the funny thing about this deal, or this job that God has for him, it's an impossible task he cannot accomplish. You know, we have some impossible tasks that we can't accomplish. God calls us to be holy, for I am holy. Impossible task for a human to do. He calls us to, to witness, and, and it's impossible for us to lead people, or to save people. That's impossible for us to do. He calls us to lead them to Christ, though. There are impossible tasks God calls for us to do each and every day that we cannot do in the flesh. And look what he tells 
Isaiah. In verse 10, he says, Make the heart of the people fat and make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart and convert and be healed. He said, I'm going to make their ears so they can't hear. I'm going to make their hearts fat so they will not be converted. I'm going to make an impossible task for you to do, but I've called you to do it. But Isaiah hadn't heard that yet. But it doesn't make a difference to him because he has gone through a process by which he has seen God and he can easily say, here am I, send me. And it doesn't matter what the call is. It doesn't matter what the job is. And we're going to follow that process that he goes through or this observation that he sees. But before we do that, I remember another guy back in Exodus chapter 3 verse 4. And his name is Moses. And when Moses sees God, he sees him in a burning bush, a representation of God in a burning bush. And here's what he says. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. He didn't say, here am I, send me. He just said, here am I. He's not yet ready to say, here am I, send me, regardless of the task. And the reason why I tie these two together is because God called Isaiah to do an impossible task, and he calls Moses to do an impossible task. Both men, he tells that. Moses forgets. Isaiah remembers. So a couple of things. First of all, if in order in your life to come to that conclusion that you're going to say, here am I, send me, regardless of what God calls you to do, some things have to happen in your life. First of all, you must see the position of God. Then you must see the power of God. Then you must see the purity of God. And then you must see the perfect sacrifice of God. Which I believe are illustrated in this passage. First of all, the position of God. Look at verse 1. He says, in, well, first of all, as a pre-note, I want to read the first part. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died. You see, the Bible is not written in, by happenstance. It's not written unorderly or disorderly. The Bible is set up in God's perfect order, and pieces like that give us things to hang our thoughts on, or hang our position on. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, we can verify that historically. We can understand when King Uzziah died. We can see, does Isaiah line up with, with King Uzziah? We can see, is this historically accurate? Obviously, I can't verify the vision that Isaiah had. I can't find that out unless I have an eyewitness, which, of course, it's his vision. We can hear him say that and see that testimony. But the Bible, written by 40 authors in three continents over a very long period of time, has one, one mission, and that's to glorify God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible gives us these pieces that we can verify historically. And as we come through here, like I said, the first thing is, Isaiah sees the position of God. Look at this, it says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. If you've never seen God sitting on His throne, you will never come to the conclusion and say, Here am I, send me. If you don't see God um, sitting on His throne, you will never actually ever come to a saving knowledge, I don't believe, of God if you've never seen Him sitting on His throne. If He sits on His throne, it means He is the boss. It means when He tells us to do something, even though it's impossible, we will do it. 1 Timothy 6.15 says of Jesus, which in His times He shall show who is the blessed and holy potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's a potentate. He's potent. He's powerful. He deserves to sit on the throne. Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture, that's clothes, on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You think you're cool this morning because your shirt says Izod. Well, maybe not. You think you're cool because your shirt says Nike. You think you're cool because your shirt's a name brand. Well, Jesus' shirt says King of Kings. And just in case... It's written on his thigh also. This is not in any ordinary throne that he sits on. Look what it says in the next part. It says, The Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. 
high and lifted up. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one. God not only sits on a throne, He sits on a throne that's high and lifted up. Unless you see Him on His throne and then see that His throne is above all other thrones, you will never come to the conclusion and stand before God and say, Here am I, send me. You'll still be sitting there saying, Yes, I'll do it, Lord, depending on what it is. He is high and lifted up. He's above all thrones. Jesus is the King of kings. He's above all, his name is above all names. It says, I dwell in Isaiah 57, 15, I dwell in the high and holy place. It says over 20 times he is called the most high God in Scripture. David said in 2 Samuel 22, 3, he says, He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge. For thou, O Lord, Psalms 97, 9, art high above all the earth and are exalted far above all gods. In 47, 2, David says, For the Lord most high is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. And you know, God wants to be the high and lofty one in our lives. Isaiah 57, 15 goes on to say, I dwell, it goes on to say, I dwell in the high and holy place, that's God, with Him. He dwells in the high and, whole, and lofty place with Him. Which Him? With Him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and revive the hearts of the contrite ones. Isaiah is going through this vision and understand that God is high and holy and He is humble and meek. Understand that God's throne sits high above all other thrones and that He sits way below that and His heart should be humble and He needs to be contrite. And unless you've gone through that process, unless you've seen God high and lifted up, you will never say, here am I, send me. You will never say, here am I, send me. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 10, 15, it tells us that we're supposed to be casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're supposed to get rid of all high things that go against God in our lives. In Romans 12, 16, mind not high things, but, con condes but condescend to men of low estate, and be not wise in your own deceits. We need to put down the things that come up against God. And he told the nation of Israel, I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols and my soul shall abhor you. He said, I'm going to, in his punishment to them, he said, I'm going to knock everything down that's in its high places, the things that they were worshiping. We have to see God in those high places. And we have to knock down the things in our life that we put in high places. The things that we do more than God. The things we care about more than God. The things that we love more than God. We have to knock those down. Well, not only do we see His throne high and lifted up. Not only do we have to see that He is high, the position of God, but we also must see the power of God, which goes along with it. Verse 4. Verse 4. I love this verse. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. That second part, the house filled with smoke, we understand to some degree that this passage is about a vision that he has. He says, I saw this. And it says he saw seraphims, which are spiritual creatures. It says the house was filled with smoke. We get this idea, like in a movie, how it kind of fades away when there's a dream happening and you go into a dream sequence. Or this idea that this is a vision that he is having, maybe a daydream, if you will. And it says, when God speaks... It says, the house was filled with smoke, but before that, the posts of the doors moved. I can preach pretty loud sometimes. I can pre preach pretty loud sometimes, but I've never seen the post shake when I speak. But when God spoke right here, the post shook. He understands the power of God, and the power of God is just in His voice. 
The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke it into existence. The Bible says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the Word of God. When we speak the Word of God into our lives, we are born again. The Bible says that we are to lay apart all superfluity of naughtiness, but and receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your soul. The Word of God has power. God spoke these things into existence, and the Word of God changes our life and salvation. Unless you understand the power of God, who's going to argue when God calls you to do impossible tasks? Wait, I don't think I can do that. I don't think that's possible. But if you understand the power of God and who He is and what He's done, there'll be no sweat for you when He calls you to do an impossible task. And so therefore, Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. He doesn't say, here am I, send me, if it's reasonable. Here am I, send me, if it's possible. I know God does call us to do some things in our own, that we can do in our own abilities, right? But He calls us to do some things we can't do on our own. And it's about whether we're going to follow Him and listen to Him. But if we've seen His power and we understand, Jeremiah 32, 17, O Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out Thine arm, and there's nothing too hard for Thee. And we understand that Jesus showed He was God when He fed the 5,000, when He made the lame to walk, when He made the blind to see. The Bible says in Him dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus was God and He proved it by the supernatural power He had. But you have to see the power of God in your life and I don't know what that means to you. Is that an intellectual thing? Do you have to understand that God made the world the way He did and that Genesis can line up with what we observe in the world and it is a true uh, uh, beginning of the world? Is it an intellectual thing for you? Maybe it's an emotional thing for you. Maybe you have to see God deliver you or, or, or do something mighty in your family before you will say, here am I, send me. But in some way you must see His throne high and lifted up and the power of God and understand that He is powerful and there's nothing that can stand against Him. The Bible says in the book of Romans, it says, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, the answer to that is anybody who wants to can try to be against us. <laughs> Lots of enemies out there. But the statement is saying no one can stand against us. There is no one who could stand against God and His Word and against His church. Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You have to see the power of God and the power of God maybe in your life before you'll come to this conclusion and say, Here am I, send me. Well, not only do we have to see the position of God and the power of God, but verse 2, we've got to understand the purity of God. This is a rather interesting passage, or this is a rather interesting turn of events. Actually, I'm sorry, verse 5. And then said, I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he saw God, he immediately understood he was no longer holy. He was no longer worthy. He was no longer able to follow God and do the things that God would have him to do. But he understands how it works out before he says, Here am I, send me. Jumping back to our story with Moses. And in Moses, in chapter 3, he says, Here am I, in chapter 3. But then in Exodus 34, and in Exodus 34, he says this, in verse 18, he said, I beseech thee, speaking to God, show me thy glory. And God says this, God says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see God and live. He has not gone through this process yet, I don't believe. He says, show me thy glory. And God said, I'll show you my glory, but here's what I'm going to have to do in verse 22. And it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with mine hand when I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face thou shalt not see. 
It wasn't too long ago, uh, well, it was several years ago when I was street preaching, and uh, a fella came and said, if you show me God, I'll believe it. Maybe you've heard me tell this story, and the young person, uh, this, young, this young man, he said, if you show me God, I'll believe it. And I said, be here at noon tomorrow, and I'll show you God. And he was an intellectual and telling me all this stuff that he learned in college, and it's impossible, and you could see it. Just for a moment, he was like, huh? And he's like, that's impossible. You can't show me God. And I said, yeah, be here at noon tomorrow. I'll show you God. And he said, what do you mean? I said, tomorrow at noon, we're going to stand here, and you and I are going to look up at the sun for one minute and see what happens. And he said, I can't do that. I'll go blind. Just like God's creation, don't look at, we can't look at the sun, but what gives, well, I asked him, what makes you think you have the right to look at God if you can't look at his creation? The Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. The Bible says that God was, uh, that he, uh, speaking of the Word of God, He was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ shows us God's glory. We understand the glory of God through Jesus Christ, through the power of Jesus Christ, through the cross of Jesus Christ. We understand the glory of God and the perfectness and the pureness of God. John 1, 18, No man has seen God any time, the only begotten Son in the bosom, he hath declared him. Exodus 33, 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, no man shall see me and live. Understanding. So here's what happens. He sees God in His perfectness, His holiness, His... We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. Um, that we can go boldly to the throne of grace in time of need. How can we do that if God is a holy God and we are a sinful people? The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says no one seeks after God and no man is going to come unto the Son unless the Father draws him. And if that's the case, how can we go boldly to the throne of grace? We can go boldly to the throne of grace because of the substitute of Jesus Christ. Because of what He's done, we can go boldly to Him in time of need. But Isaiah hasn't figured that out yet. Here he comes through and says, I'm undone. He realizes he's a sinner. He realizes he's without, he can't do these things that God has for him. He realizes he's in trouble. But then, verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto him, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with his tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sins purged. He takes a coal, a very hot coal, and puts it on his lips. <laughs> That didn't, that's not going to feel too good, is it? And he said, these uh, sins are purged. That is not the way our sins are purged. But remember, this is a vision. Our sins are purged once we understand that we are undone, that we are worthless, that all of our works, are as fil all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. When we understand that, then we look to God and His high, the lofty one, and we say, Lord save me. And he doesn't bring a coal down and put it on your lips. He sends his son. The perfect sacrifice of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Hebrews 7, 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for his people. For this he did once when he offered himself up. That's talking about Jesus. In Jeremiah 32, 17. O Lord God, behold thou hast made the heavens and the, with thy great power. Because he has the power, he has given us the opportunity. You know, every judgment that I look through in the Bible, I see the grace of God. In the judgment of the world during the flood, he gave the grace of God with an ark. Through the judgment of God and the people of Israel, he gave grace because he sent deliverers. Through the judgment of God, in our sins, he sent Jesus Christ, his son. That we might see the perfect sacrifice it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the perfect sacrificial lamb. And his sacrifice is this. He comes in and God does something to his lips because God has called him to preach or to speak. And so he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't do what you said, God. I'm not holy like you are. If you look at the sun during that eclipse, your eyes won't be dilated during the total eclipse, and so the rays of the sun can still can burn your eyes. 
If you look at a holy God without your eyes adjusted, you're going to be in trouble. Here's what we do. Our eyes haven't been adjusted. We look around and I say, well, I'm a pretty good fella. I go to church most Sundays. I do right. I do good. I'm better than old so-and-so. The problem is we've adjusted our eyes of holiness to the world around us. We have to adjust our eyes to the holiness of God. God is holy and perfect and called us to be holy and perfect. God is pure and our eyes must be clearly adjusted to see the holy God and not look at the holiness around us. God ta taught me a uh, powerful and annoying lesson. When I lived in Utah and we were in a homeowners association, avoid those at all possible if you can. And in this homeowners association, there's some kind of nonsense about keeping your lawn mowed. And of course, I kept my mom, I'm glad we live out in the country. We're not tomorrow lawn, right? We keep our lawn nice and trim and everything look good. And we get this notice about how our lawn didn't look good. And I said, you got to be kidding me. It looks perfect. I thought, you're right? And I looked around all the yards around us and I was like, oh, that yard, look, look the grass is up here in that yard. And that yard's full of dirt. And, and I said, my yard looks pretty good. And we tried to do some changes to the yard. And the next month, another letter came with another fine. And I was like, I thought we were doing pretty good. And it turns out it was a piece of crabgrass up in the front corner, which I felt like wasn't even our property because it was on the right of way. And that's what we were getting fined about. But all the while, I'm saying, God, look, I mean, I was saying to them, not to God, I was saying to the homeless, look at everybody else's yard. And God said, don't care about everybody else, care about you. God said, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you seeing me in my holiness. I don't want you to look around and see the holiness of everybody else or the, the goodness of everybody else. I want you to look at me and understand the holiness in me and then adjust your eyes to see me clearly. The perfect sacrifice of God. Isaiah sees all of that. And that's when he gets to the point where he says, Here am I, send me. And only through that will we come to the conclusion and declare, Here am I, send me. And the holiness of God you had. So here it is in this vision. We see God high and lifted up and sitting on his throne. We see his train fill the temple. And for those of you who don't know what a train is, I think of a woman who's walking down the aisle to be married, and sometimes they have those long dresses. That's called a train. And I think of God's glory, his purity, his perfectness, filling the whole entire temple. So there's no place for anything else but God's holiness in his temple. And then he had these seraphims crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And these seraphims, these aren't these little fat baby angels with wings that are playing the harp that we buy at the Christian bookstore. These are some scary suckers. It says that they've got six wings with two that cover their eyes and two that cover their face and with two they do fly. And they're crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In the book of Revelation, it, it, it says that there's another creature. And this time it has eyes all over his body. And it has six wings. And this one cries, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty for all eternity. Unless you understand the holiness of God. And then humble yourselves and realize that Jesus is the perfect sacrificial lamb. You will never come to the conclusion. You'll never say, God, here am I, send me. Because you're going to be stuck saying, I'll do it, God. Depending on what it is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much.